All right, let's bow our heads in prayer. Father God, I thank you for this message that you've laid on my heart. Thank you that it will go forth and that it will not return void, but it will accomplish that which you please, and it will prosper in the thing where into it's sent. And I thank you, Father God, that I will open my mouth wide, and you'll fill it with your words. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. This is Joshua 1, 9. As children of God, God tells us repeatedly in his word, do not be afraid, I am with you. We, as children of the Most Highest, are to be bold for the Lord, to not be afraid of what the enemy uh, may do or may say. We're not to be dismayed and, and in confusion and feeling anxious and worried and fretful because, as I said, the Lord is with us whithersoever we go, and he will fight our battles. The Bible says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted among the people. So we are not to let the devil keep us from doing what God calls us to do, to push us down, to immobilize us, to lock us in his chains of fear because and, and steal of our hope and joy and, and our anticipation of what God may do just because of fear. Fear of what the world may say or do to us. Fear of failing in what God has called us to do and not doing it 100% perfectly. Fear that God won't actually answer our prayers, that he won't come through for us or heal us or preserve us or deliver us or sustain us. And we are not to be making any of our decisions based on fear. In the story of Joshua in the walls of Jericho, we see that the children of God are facing an insurmountable obstacle. In the natural, the walls of Jericho are unconquerable and they are unbreakable. In fact, according to resources online, these walls are six feet thick. They could ride chariots up on those walls. And they're anywhere from 11 to 15 feet high. And some places even say they had two sets of walls um, in the walls of Jericho. But God told Joshua in the face of this insurmountable odds, he said to him in Joshua 6, See, I have given into your hand Jericho and the king and the mighty men of valor. Because Jericho not only had walls, it had its own army. And they were well known for even God called them mighty men of valor. But he said to Joshua, you will compass the city, which means walk around the city, all ye men of war, and go around the city once. This you will do for six days days and seven priests will bear the ark with seven trumps of ram's horns and the seventh day you will compass go around the city seven times and then the priest will blow with the horns and it will come to pass that when you make a long blast with the ram's horn and when you hear the sound of the trumpet all the people will shout with a great shout and the wall of the city shall fall down flat and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him so at this point, Joshua had received his marching orders as, and he had a choice like we all do in life when God gives us instructions. He could have said no. He could have let fear consume him and say, God, you can't conquer this enemy. Wait, you want me to yell at these walls that are six feet thick and to blow a horn and you think that's going to fix this? No, this is too dangerous. In fact, I must be making up these instructions. And if we walk around those walls, they're probably going to shoot at us and kill us if we do it day after day. And so Joshua faced this decision. Would he go and do what God had commanded him and trust in the Lord and obey him? Or would he let fear consume him and turn his back on God's will for his life? Because the previous generation of Israelites, they said no to God. Because he said, go up into the promised land. I will give it to you. I will be with you. I will conquer the, your enemies for you. I am for you, not against you. No one will be able to stand against you. For it is the Lord thy God that does go before you. He will not fail thee nor forsake thee. But even though they'd seen all of his miracles, him splitting the Red Sea, him providing manna in the desert, and a uh, quail being rained down from heaven and striking the rock and water gushing forth and wiping out the whole Egyptian army in the sea, they said, no, 
No, we refuse to trust in you, Lord. We're not going to go in. In fact, it was so bad that in Numbers 14, they had said, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in the wilderness, and why has the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return to Egypt? And then they tried to stone Joshua and Caleb, who said, No, we can go into the land. We are more than able. And they tried to elect leaders to take them back into Egypt. Such doubt, such fear, and such rebellion instead of trusting in God. They refused to trust in God, no matter what he had done for them. And we need to be careful because there's many times in our lives where God has come through for us. He has answered our prayers. He has held our hands. He has sustained us. But then something up comes up in our life. And then there's that moment of unbelief and fear where God calls us, step out in faith. Do as I command you. Go conquer your Jerichos. Leave your Egypts. Leave your addictions behind. Leave your comfort zones and walk out. Walk out where, you're, where you may think, where you have to trust in me. And so we have to be careful that we don't end up like those Israelites who said, no, we won't go. Because saying no to God does not mean we can just stay in comfort for the rest of our lives and then enter heaven and say, hey, you know what worked for me? I said no. No, that does not work at all. In fact, the people who disobey God, it says, I am the savior of all those that obey me. And so we are to obey God. And when we disobey him and we refuse to step forward when he tells us to, it actually opens the door for the enemy. And it can end in our destruction. Just like a story I told several weeks ago about a man who was working a very good job at building bridges. And he had a good income. And God called him to step by faith into full-time ministry. And he was afraid of it, so he stayed on his job. And you know what? He was working under a bridge one day, and I guess, I don't know if it was a metal wire, something snapped, and it ended up falling on him and crippling him for, for my knowledge, his life, because it op his disobedience opened the door for the devil. And so I know we're afraid we can let fear of the unknown keep us from obeying God, but let me tell you, we should have godly fear of what our disobedience will cause. And it is better for us to move forward in fear and trembling, trusting God, than it is to stay in this place of stagnation and fear. And because as I said, it can end in destruction. It can open the door for Satan because you know what? It did for these Israelites, the first generation, because of their lack of faith, their rebellion, their desire to go back to their old ways, to Egypt, their disobedience, their lack of trust. God actually became angry. And he said in Deuteronomy 1, surely there shall not one of these men of this evil generation see that good land. God called them evil. Do you know the Bible says, without faith it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. The Israelites did not believe that he was, and that he would come through for them. And so he called them an evil generation. And we do not want to be called an evil generation. And so he says that they would not see the good land. Only Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, he will see it. And to him I will give the land that he has trodden upon, and to his children, because, listen to this, he has wholly followed the Lord. He wholly followed God. And in verse 39, God says, Moreover, your little ones, the ones you said would be a prey, and your children, which in today they have no knowledge between good and evil, they will go in hither, and unto them I will give it, and they will possess it. But as for you, turn you and take your journey into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. And so all that generation, consumed by their lack of trust and obedience, they died in their wilderness. How many of us, we have a promise from God, and it requires that first step of obedience, of just going where he go, tells us to go. But we haven't taken it because of uncertainties, because the circumstances don't seem perfect for us, because of fear and doubt and unbelief. And all of us, we have a calling, a gifting in our lives, be it in the, our ability to speak, reading, writing, cooking, whatever it may be. And now, how many of us are letting the fear of 
not being able to successfully do it, or we don't think we have all of our resources, or we all have our ducks in a row, but it is keeping us from stepping forward into that calling that God has for us. Or maybe God has called us to sell our property, our possessions, and to leave to a different area and to work there or to travel and tell the gospel. Maybe he has asked you, trust in me to heal you. Stop running to the men in the medical world. Stop listening to their suggestions. They're destroying you. Why don't you trust in me? Why don't you just listen to me and take that step of faith? Maybe he's asked you to trust him with who you should marry in his timing, in his way, even if it takes years, even if it's a lot longer than you think. Maybe he has asked you to witness to somebody in spite of having fear and that fear is holding you back. My fellow Christians, we need to stop making our decisions, to stop living our lives, to stop disobeying God because of fear of doubt and anxiety and unbelief. There are Jerichos in all of our lives that seem to have unconquerable walls and we look at them and we back off in fear saying, oh no, that's too big of a project for me to take on. That's too big of a mountain for me to climb. That's too big. That's insurmountable. I can't achieve that. But God is just asking us to take one step at a time. And you know, our very first step is by faith to proclaim, Lord, you are my king. And to you, I say, yes, sir. Living in the middle of a battlefield, I'm fighting the enemy surrounding me. My only weapons are the sword and shield. And to the stranger's eyes, it looks like there's no hope against overwhelming heights. I've reached the end of my road. And then a voice shouts from the dark nails, stand strong and be courageous. Green night, all fray, neither be dismayed. And to my king, to my side, say, yes, sir, yeah, yes, sir. I say, yes, sir, yeah, yes, sir. He issues his commands, and I will quickly stand to carry out his word. I put my hand to my brow, I am nothing right now. He is my king, and I'll say, yes, sir, yeah, yes, sir. I'll say, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir, yeah, yes, sir. I'll say, yes, sir, yes, sir. The Lord, he is my king, and I say, yes, sir. We're fighting. This war for robbing mortal souls Wrestling the darkness out of flesh and bone We're doomed to failure if we stand on our own But we are not alone He's standing beside us And if we only listen His voice will lead and guide us Hear his voice shout from the dark nail Stand strong and be courageous Be not afraid neither be dismayed And to my kings to my side say Yes sir, yeah yes sir We say yes sir, yeah yes sir He issues his commands And we will quickly stand To carry out his word We put our hands to our brows We are moving right now and we say, yes, sir, yeah, yeah, so we yes, sir, yes, sir, yeah, yeah, so we yes, sir, yes, sir. The Lord is a king, and we say, yes, sir, yes, sir. We are in the to the death, oh, yes, sir. We will crucify our flesh and say, yes, sir. Send us to the nations to fight the war and bring salvation, no matter the cost. We will carry our cross and say, yes, sir, yeah, yes, sir. We say, yes, sir, yeah, yes, sir. He issues his commands, and we will quickly stand to carry out his word. Yes, we are guaranteed to win the victory. So lay aside your doubt and say, yes, sir, yeah, yes, sir. 
talking when we say uh, yes, sir. Joshua received his marching orders and he said, yes, sir. And that's what we need to do. We need to go forth and say, yes, sir even in the face of the impossible. So Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priest, and he gave them their marching orders and said, take up the Ark of the Covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord. And he said to the people, pass on and walk around the city and let him that is armed walk before the Ark of the Lord. And it came to pass that when Joshua had spoken to the people, that the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns passed on before the Lord and blew with the trumpets, and the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord followed them. And the armed men went before the priest that blew with the trumpets, and the rearward came after the Ark, the priest going on and blowing with the trumpets. And Joshua had commanded the people, saying, You will not shout, nor make any noise with your voice, neither will any word proceed out of your mouth until the day I bid you shout. Then you will shout. So the ark of the Lord went around the city, going about it once, and they came into the camp and lodged in the camp. So Joshua gave his people their instructions straight from God. And there's something that's very important to note about this historical account. It's that God gave Joshua specific instructions to be followed by faith one step at a time. And Joshua obeyed down to the smallest detail. He didn't add his own wisdom in here and there and say, well, God probably did not notice how strong this enemy is. So I will add some extra precautions and backups and I'll add this extra step here and there. I'll have my armed men shooting on the walls to protect everybody else. I'll just go three fourths or you know, four fifths around the city and maybe I'll do this and that just to make sure everything turns out right. No, Joshua followed God's instructions perfectly. And so if God tells us certain instructions, we are to follow them perfectly. If he tells us to wait or go somewhere, don't rush, don't change my instructions. And when we have the peace of God which passes all understanding, then we just need to do what God tells us to do. We are to follow God's instructions by faith and not add in our own wisdom. My mom and I, we like to talk about how God will try to instruct us and then we're most, we like to add a little bit of extra information as in God will tell us turn right and we'll add at the next stop sign. But we added it and then we wonder why we end up in a traffic jam or we end up lost or at the wrong place or things are not working out. And a lot of us, we are doing the same things in our life. God gives us a dream, he gives us instructions, and then we, <laughs> a, a funny story is a man who God told him to buy this piece of property. And so he was a pastor, he bought that piece of property, and then he built a church building on it. Anyway, everything ended up a mess, and he went before God and he says, you told me to buy this piece of land. He says, I did not tell you to build that church on it. I was gonna have you hold on to that piece of land and as the value went up, I was gonna have you resell it and use that funds for the ministry. And so this man added extra instructions to God's first step and he ended up in a mess. And so a lot of us, we wanna blame God, but it's time we humble ourselves and admit, okay, Lord, maybe I moved too fast or maybe I didn't wait on your timing or I, I took your first step, but then I added my own wisdom in there. And so it's not God's fault when things don't turn out. We need to learn to follow his instructions and we have all missed it. So I'm not standing up here saying, well, I've always perfectly followed God's instructions. That is not the case. And so we all need to humble ourselves and, you know, just say, oh, Lord, please forgive me. I really missed it. Help me to learn to just take step by step and listen to you and not add in my own wisdom here and there and try to make a back door and create an escape plan and just, just obey you and trust in you, Lord. So, but some of you may say, well, you say to follow God's instructions, Stephanie, but I don't even know what those instructions are. I'm just standing here, I'm just going through life, feeling confused, I don't even know what he wants me to do. Where does he even want me to go? And so 
What we need to do in that case is just go back to the very basic first instructions that God has given us. And the Bible says in John 6, 53 to 55, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. So we're supposed to be eating God's flesh and drinking his blood, but we can't literally get a hold of his flesh and blood. So what does that mean? Well, John 1, 14 clears it up and says, the word, the word of God was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. And so the word was made flesh. And when God says to eat my flesh, he's saying to eat his words, to eat the scriptures. So our first, almost our first basic instruction from God that we are supposed to be following after repenting of our sins and putting our faith in Jesus Christ is to eat the flesh of Jesus. And as I said, the word was made flesh. So we are to eat and drink the word of God. How many of us are, you know, we're wandering through life and we're going to church on Sunday and maybe we're throwing some tithe in the bucket, but we don't really know God's voice. and We don't know what our marching orders are. And, and even then we're struggling with fear and everything else. Well, let me tell you, it's because we need to go back to this basic instruction. Uh, I remember this man, he was witnessing to a Christian and this, he asked him, well, when's the last time you read your Bible? And he says, well, it was a few years ago. That's not acceptable. This is the basic instruction that God has said. He said, unless ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And so we are to eat the word of God by reading it, singing it, speaking it, listening to it, meditating on it. You know how you take a worry and you think, oh, I don't know if this is going to turn out. Oh, I don't know if I have enough money. Oh, well, push those out, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So what do you replace those thoughts with? The word of God saying, casting all your cares upon him for he cares for you. But my Lord God shall provide everything according to your needs, according to his riches and glory. And we, we speak that with our mouth. We meditate on it. And how do you speak on it, meditate on it? Well, you've got to get it. You've got to eat the word of God first to even know it's there. Jeremiah 15 verse 16 says thy words were found they were found he had to hunt them out he had to look for them in the word of God and I did eat them and then when he ate them he says thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart for I am called by thy name O Lord God of hosts and so a lot of us, we want joy. We want to have life in us, but we're turning to so many things we shouldn't be turning to. We're turning to buying kitchen gadgets, buying purses, buying another saw, or just achievements or something. And But the Bible says that if you want life, you're gonna find it in the Word of God. So all the way back, meditate on the Word of God. Give thyself wholly to it that thy profiting may appear to all. In fact, Joshua 1 verse 8 the very book that we're going out of where Joshua text Jericho says, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate, which means think about it, ponder on it, muse on it, day and night, that thou mayest observe, which means do according to all that is written therein. We're not just listening it, we're doing it. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. And right after Joshua 1 verse 8, we read Joshua 1 verse 9. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. So do we get the connection between these two verses? Because this is really powerful. And this is life changing and transforming if we will take hold of it and do it. Do you know what comes before being strong and have a good courage and being not afraid and learning to trust in God? Joshua 1 8, meditating on God's word day and night, knowing what is in it. We have to 
find what is it. Open your pages of your Bible, read through them, find what is in the Bible. And then when you read those words, take them to heart, speak them with our mouth, meditate them, keep them in front of our eyes, keep them in our hearts. And then we observe it and we do it. And when he says, bless those which persecute you, rejoice with them that do rejoice, Speak evil of no man. Let no corrupt communications proceed out of your mouth. Do not lie. Do not steal. And we say, okay, this is God's basic instructions for me. You know what, Lord? I do know what you want me to do. You want me to behave as you tell me to in your Bible, to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, soul, body, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. So if you're confused as to even what to do, well, you need to follow the instructions in the Bible. We are we are supposed to eat his flesh. And so, so many of us, we can't even get past the fear and the doubts and the unbelief, and we really struggle with them and the uncertainties. And so what's happening is we're stuck in this desert of being immobilized, not knowing where to go, not knowing what to do, of being confused, of getting free from doubt and addictions. And it's because we have not even obeyed God's basic instructions. And we say, well, Steph, you know, I have a verse. I know a verse. I, I kind of look at the Word of God. I, I kind of know it. No, you've got to marinate in it. It's just like you don't only eat one egg a day and then say, well, I ate today. I don't need to eat anymore. That is not going to work. You're going to shrivel up and die. You need, instead of listening to hours of podcast, why don't you turn on the Bible and listen to it? Instead of turning on the TV as noise in the background and just listening to some sports, why don't you turn on the Bible or scripture songs or worship songs and listen to those instead? You need to marinate yourself in the Word of God and push out all the darkness. The Bible says, if thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? So many of us, we say, well, I do have the Word of God, but are you meditating on it day and night? Are you musing on it? Are you pondering on it? I remember one time I was driving in the car and I was thinking of this one, and it says, let the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. Let the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. Let the peace of God, which passes all understanding. It doesn't, it says, let it. You know, God, his peace is there for you. But a lot of times, sometimes we just keep on pushing that peace away because we're so stressed, we're so worried, and we won't let it into God's hands. At that point, he's saying, let the peace of God prevail in you. Trust in me. And so that is what meditating on God's word will do. It, as I was musing, the fire burned. If we muse on the word of God, it's our eyes keeping on Jesus. And all of a sudden, our whole body is full of light. And God says this, if we abide in him and our words, he says, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. John 15 verses 7 to 8. And so the fruit that comes out of God's word abiding in us and him abiding in us and being in our heart, that fruit is God's character and nature. And that's what God wants to see first and foremost in our lives. It's love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. He's not after you having thousands of people or followers on Instagram or Facebook or YouTube, or you having a well-known following or selling millions of books. I'm not saying that'll never happen, but that is not God's absolute, his, that is not what he's looking at. He's looking at the fruit that we are producing. And so the first generation of Israelites could not get this, that man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And God was trying to teach them this. He's trying to teach us this. In Deuteronomy 8, it says, You shall remember all the ways in which the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you, to prove you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or no. And he humbled you and suffered you to hunger and fed you with manna, which thou did not know, neither did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord does man 
live. So how many of us are stuck in our deserts? How many of us are stuck going around the mountains where we feel like we aren't seeing any breakthroughs in our life and that no matter how much do we try, we're not getting victory and we can't seem to take that next step forward and we're not achieving that dream that we believe that God has placed in our hearts. And let me tell you, a lot of us, it's because we have just not learned this truth, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Many of us will take that first step sometimes. Maybe we'll, we'll start a ministry, even if it's just a little Bible study, and no one's showing up or only one person showing up. And and we don't understand that it's all about pleasing and loving God and that we're just doing it even maybe just for the one. And so we just, we kind of give up. But no, God is, he wants to know what's in your heart. Are you doing it for man's praise, for their accolades? Are you doing it for Jesus? Are you willing to stand in that gap? Even if you hardly have any viewers, even if you hardly have any people attending your Bible studies, even if you don't think you're making much of a, of a splash in the community, are you willing to do what God has laid on your heart for year after year after year? year because he's proving you. He wants to know, will you do it for him? Because I remember over eight plus years ago that I started singing songs and I started doing scripture songs and I sat in front of this old quality camera in a room with no background music, no, I couldn't play any instruments and there was nothing impressive about these recordings. And I have a perfectionist kind of type A personality and I didn't even want to do it because I wanted to have the full production. I wanted it to sound amazing. And I heard a still small quiet whisper and he says, will you still do it for me? And he was saying, will you still do it, Stephanie, even though everything is not perfect, even though you don't have all the resources, even though it's not even close to what you want it to be? And I said, Yes, Lord, I will still do it. And so I started faithfully stepping forward, even though, you know, we get 35 views on my videos and mostly because dad would push them year after year after year, eight, 10 years. And even now I don't get that many views, but God said, will you still do it? So many of us, we think, well, I am not in God's will. I, I'm not really seeing a difference. You could be smack dab in the middle of God's will because you're not supposed to live by bread alone, by people's accolades, by necessarily great financial gains, but you're proceeding and living by the word of God. And so we need to make sure though that we're not stuck in a desert because we're failing to hide God's word in our heart because we constantly are going to other things to fulfill us instead of marinating in God's word. And so Joshua though, he learned this truth that man does not live by bread alone. In Joshua, he took this word of God to his heart. When God said, go and you are able to overcome, he said, wow, that word is in my heart. I believe in that word, Lord. So he knew who God was and how powerful he was. One, because he had seen all of God's miracles in Egypt, and two, he hid God's words in his heart. And when the Lord told him to face an unconquerable enemy behind the walls of Jericho and to do something that seemed utterly ridiculous, he did not argue. And he trusted and he obeyed in God. So it's just like that old hymn. And God likes to bring this to my heart anytime that fear tries to overwhelm me and say, no, just say no to God. That's too much. And God will bring this. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still. And with the whole will trust and obey, trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. So again, I say that we need, we need to trust and obey God. That we need to learn that it's not about accolades. It's about eating the flesh of God, the flesh of the Son of Man, and living by the Word of God. And so Joshua, he trusted and obeyed. And Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priest took up the ark of the Lord. And the seven breeds priest bore seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord, and they went continually, and they blew with the trumpets, and the armed men went before them, but the rear reward came after the ark of the Lord, the priest going on and blowing with the trumpets. And the second day they walked around the city once and returned to the camp, and they did this six days. And then on the seventh day they rose early in the dawn of the day, and they walked around that city the same manner seven times 
Only on this day, like I said, they compassed the city seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time when the priest blew with the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city, and the city shall be accursed, even it and all that are therein to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, and she and all that are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And right there, and then he tells them, you're not allowed to keep anything from the city, nothing accursed, none of the silver or the gold, and that everything is supposed to go to the Lord. And so right after Joshua gave them instructions, it says in verse 20, so the people shouted. So right here, it's very important to note that they followed God's instructions, not just the first day, not just the second day, not just the third day, but all the way to the very last step. Some of us, we are waiting, waiting for God to walk, knock down the walls of our Jerichos, but we haven't even taken the next step he's given us. And it can be as simple as giving up an addiction that God wants us to let go of, reading, watching something, uh, getting wrapped up in some kind of hobby that's consuming all of our time, or God telling us, I have this place for you, and I've been waiting for you to list your house, but we, we're uncertain and we're waiting for something to be perfect. So it could be that we just need to list our house or sell something when he tells us he has a place for us. It could be decorating a nursery because God has promised us that there will not be barren among you. Or like I said earlier, it could be because we're not even eating the word of God. We're not even following his first basic instructions and meditating on it. So if we're stuck and we don't know why the walls of our Jericho are not going down, we don't know why the next thing's not happening, we need to go to God and say, Lord, why? Why? Why is this not moving anywhere? Why is this situation stagnant? What next step have you laid on my heart and I've just missed it or I've ignored it or I have failed to take that step? Because, or is it my lack of hiding your word in my heart so I can understand what is your voice versus the devil's because maybe I'm not listening to you the way I should? Or is it just me? trying to push forward and doing it through my own effort and my own power. Because I remember these last eight plus years, I was thinking of all the songs that God had given me and I would think, you know what? Maybe I'm not doing something. Maybe I need to do something through my own effort and God's waiting for me to push through. And every time I would try to do something, it met with failure because I was trying to do it through my effort and my power and I was trying to get the cart ahead of the horse. So sometimes, that is just what we're doing instead of waiting on God. And he actually has us where he wants us, but we just need to endure, to run the race with patience set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Because if we try to get ahead of God, like that man who built the, the ministry on that piece of land he got ahead of God, it's not going to end well. Just like when the Israelites, well, they changed their mind. They thought, okay, we can go up and take this promised land after God got angry with them. And they decided they were going to go through it with their own strength and power and muscle through. And God told them, don't go up there. Don't fight. I'm not among you, lest you be smitten before your enemies. So I spoke to you, but you would not hear. You rebelled against the commandment of the Lord, and you went presumptuously up into the hill. And the Amorites, Amorites, which dwell in that mountain, they came out against you. They chased you as bees do, and they destroyed you in Seir, even unto Hormah. So these men, they try to do it through their own strength and conquer their enemies and attain their goals and their promised lands through their own strength and their own methods. It reminds me of a story in Demas Shakarian and the Happiest People on Earth. And he was trying to start up the fellowship, Christian Bible Fellowship, if I think that's the name. And so he thought, okay, God laid this dream on my heart. I need to do something. So he got on a plane and he went everywhere and he wore himself out trying to get this thing started. It didn't work. And so finally he went before God and God says, it's, he, he pretty much told him, you've been trying to do it through your power, through your wisdom, through your strength. Now can you wait on me? And so he did. And in God's timing, 
God turned it around and it became a humongous Christian Bible fellowship that we, many of us still talk about today. And so sometimes what we need to do in life as we follow God's basic instructions and keep on hiding his word in our heart and keep on meditating on it and keep on drawing closer to Jesus and developing his character and nature and strengthening ourselves in him, as we do that, we just need to place the dreams he's placed in our hearts in his hands and say, Lord, in your time, according to your instructions. And as I said, sometimes that is just rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself. If something's not happening, then we need to dig deep into the word of God. Send our foundations deep in his word that because maybe God knows that that next step he has for us, we won't make it through if we don't have a deep foundation in him. And so we seek the Lord actively. We seek, we, we talk to him, we pray to him, we praise to him. We have his word in our heart. We abide in his word and we rest in him. So this is an instruction that God has led me to so many times when I wondered what I should do and or if if I needed to do something to achieve the promise or something, he would lead me to Lamentations 3, 24 to 26. It says, the Lord is my portion. Remember, the promise isn't your fulfillment. It's not going to make you happy. It's not going to fulfill you. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good to them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. A lot of us, we need to stop fretting, stop running around, stop trying to do things in our own power, make things happen, or need to stop being immobilized by fear and not doing anything at all. Instead, we need to go back, as I said, and I'm going to repeat this until we get it. Dig into the deep into the word of God to hope in the Lord. Just because we're waiting doesn't mean we've lost our hope. Just because we're waiting doesn't mean we've given up. It just means, Lord, just like Joseph who was in that dungeon, I am just going to hope and quietly wait. And this, I will see the salvation of the Lord. So stop fretting, stop worrying, stop being anxious about the future. If God has made a promise to you and it is truly from him, then all you need to do is to continually seek him day after day, month after month, year after year. Be patient in the Lord, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And of course, that's talking about food and raiment, but it's also anything that God has promised to us. All these things shall be added unto us. Healing, provision, dreams, Matthew 6, verse 33. So if God has given you a dream, don't turn that into an idol and do anything you can do to get it done or step back in fear and not do anything. Place those dreams in God's hands and wait on him. That is what Joshua did. Because we can go on, Joshua conquered Jericho, so on, so on forth. But do you know what? He had to wait an extra 40 years in the desert because of the Israelites' disobedience. And he hoped and he waited and he anticipated for the day God would lead him into the promised land. He could have fretted. He could have become worried. He could have given up hope. He could have become bitter over what happened because it was those people who told him and Caleb, no, we won't go into the promised land. And they threatened to stone him and kill him and take his life. And he could have come become bitter against them and lost all of his hope. So, but instead, he walked in love and he walked in anticipation for what God would do for him. And you know what? Even then, even though he was stuck in that desert an extra 40 years, God watched out for Joshua. God watched out for Caleb, the two spies who said that God was able, and he took care of them. In Joshua verse 14, I mean, in Joshua chapter 14, we read, Caleb said, Now look, the Lord has kept me alive. As he said, these 40 and 5 years, ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now, lo, I am this day 40 score and 5 years old, which means I'm 85 years old. And yet, at 85, I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. As my strength was then, even so my strength is now for war, both to go out and to come in. Do we hear what God did for Caleb? And, pro and most likely, undoubtedly, for Joshua as well. He was just as strong as he was 45 years earlier. His strength was not abated. And so some of us, 
We need to stop fretting over our age. God's promises to us for marriage, for children, for ministry, for uh, whatever he's laid in our heart does not vanish as we get older. And his power to bring that promise through does not disappear as we start getting gray hair. Our age is not an obstacle to our powerful, all-knowing, omnipotent God. Let me say that again. Your age is not an obstacle to God keeping his promises. So we need to stop letting the devil push us into making bad decisions as to who we marry or getting the wrong job or buying the wrong house or making the wrong purchases because we're afraid the, mar the market's running out of time and all the houses are being sold and we just need to get in there. And so we think we're running out of time. So we rush into these bad decisions. Remember, that's what Abraham did. He was getting older. He was running out of time. So what did he do? He went into Hagar and he had Ishmael. So we need to stop, stop rushing into decisions because of fear. And we also, on the flip side, need to stop letting Satan keep us from stepping forward because of fear. We need to take that step forward. Any decision to rush or to stay back or hesitate because of fear is the wrong decision. So look at Joshua. Look at how he trusted in the Lord. He meditated on the word of God. He hid it in his heart and he believed in that word. He was bold because of this and he followed through on God's word and he waited on God's timing. Then when God said go, he went. He immediately went. God gave him his marching orders and he said, yes, sir. And he followed those instructions to the T step by step without hesitating and without adding in his own earthly wisdom. And that took faith. He didn't let fear keep him back from obeying God and from putting his trust in him, just like Esther, who she had been placed as queen of all of Babylon. And so her uncle Mordecai says, when the people were gonna be all killed by Haman, and he says, you need to go before the king. And she says, but if the king does not hold out this golden scepter to me, then I will be killed. And he says, if you don't go before him and you try to keep your life alive, God will save the Israelites, the Jews, by somebody else's hands. But you and your whole household will perish. He says, Esther, for such a time as this, you were placed there. And so she said, you know what? I've received my marching orders. And she didn't literally say that, but she knew that she had something that God had laid on her heart that she had to do. She had to go before that king. And she said, ultimately, I will go. And if I perish, I perish. We need to take these words to heart no matter what lies in front of us and say every day, I will go. Like Esther, called into the palace, we are placed here for a certain purpose. To be like Esther, when she reached that moment, the moment she must decide if she were to obey or try to save her life. Instead of running away, instead of fleeing the call, she said to one, she said to the more. I will go, oh, 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 I will go, oh, oh, though I lose my life, though I lose it all, I will lay my life down for the righteous cause. I will go, oh, 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 I will go, oh, 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 I will lay my dreams down at God's feet, let his will be Like Ruth, you have called me from the darkness, ordained me and given me a purpose. You have asked me, will I trust and follow, follow your will for me, or will I run away in fear and disbelief? Instead of running away, instead of fleeing the call, I say to you, I say to the moon. I will go, oh, 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 I will go, oh, oh, though I lose my life, though I lose it all, I will lay my life down for the righteous cause, I will go, oh, 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 I will go, oh,
wall. I will lay my dreams down at God's feet. Let God's will be done in me. I will go. I will go in spite of fears, in spite of doubts, in spite of tears. I will go though I know there will be trials and troubles which appear just like the prophets of old, facing dangers unknown. I will count the cost and take up my cries. I will go, oh, 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 I will go, oh, oh, though I lose my life, though I lose it all. I will lay my life down for the righteous cause. I will go, oh, 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 I will go, oh, 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 for the crown of life that's to be gained. Jesus, I'll declare your name and I will go, oh, 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 I will go, oh, 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 I will lay my dreams down at your feet, here I am, Lord, use me, I will go. We need to tell God, I will go. Jesus says, fear not them which kill the body, but not are able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So we're not to fear mankind or how they'll respond or react or if they'll take our jobs or they'll take our lives or they'll take things from us because that brings a snare and it opens the door for death and destruction for just like Nebuchadnezzar, who refused to humble himself in the sight of God. And so God ended up having to cause him to be a beast for seven years out in the field because he wouldn't humble and obey God. And Zedekiah, uh, who refused to surrender to King Nebuchadnezzar. And he had his sons killed in front of his eyes and his eyes put out. Then there's Saul, who refused to humble himself and obey God. And so he ended up falling on his own sword over and over. We see people who lived their lives, who made decisions out of pride, who lived their lives out of fear. And they ended up ending very badly. And that that is not what we want to happen to us. And then we don't want to be blaming God for the repercussions of us not trusting in him. But on the flip side, for those who trusted and obeyed God, God did incredible things for them. Just like the story of Esther we just discussed and her people, we read her story and how she went before the king and through God's grace and strength, she did save all of her people. And so we read her story now thousands of years later. We make musicals and theater programs and, and movies and we read books about Esther and what a story we still read, all because she trusted and obeyed. And we still read and celebrate the story of Joshua and the battle of Jericho and how it ended in verse 20 when we read, the people shouted, they blew their trumpets and it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him and they took the city and they utterly destroyed all that was in the city. No one stood before them because they obeyed the Lord and they trusted in him. And nothing can stand before us as we seek the Lord and we hide his word in our heart and we do according to his commandments. And what is that commandment that we come down to? The basics of loving Jesus and obeying him. And he says, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, and strength. And thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And so first and foremost, before we even think about all the decisions that maybe God is, has laid on our hearts and so on and so forth, go back to the basic instructions of Christ. Those basic instructions are to hide his word in our heart, to meditate on it. And in hiding his word in our heart, he equips us to do the ultimately two commandments. That is the most important thing, my fellow brother and Christians. It's not about ministries. It's not about achieving dreams. It's, it says, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength, and love thy neighbor as thyself. And this is what God wants us to do ultimately. So we don't need to be confused. That is God's basic instruction. And in there, we wait on the Lord and patiently endure. And we do as he calls us to do step by step. And then when he tells us to move, 
Do not let fear stop you from moving forward. And as you move forward, don't add extra instructions. And as you move forward, go all the way. Don't stop halfway. Don't stop halfway around the walls of Jericho. Walk all the way around. One, two, three, four, five, six days, seven years, no matter what it takes, keep on enduring, keep on going forward, and you will see the walls of your Jericho come down. You will see the dreams that God's laid on your heart be achieved. You will see a breakthrough. Just endure in the Lord. Hide his word in your heart. Seek to love him. Love people as he's told you to love them, and keep on going forward. Do not let fear keep you back or immobilize you. And so let's bow our heads in prayer. Father God, I thank you for this message that you have laid upon my heart. And I pray, Lord, that you help me to be bold for you, no matter what it is, and to witness to people, and to sing for you, and to preach for you, or just enduring day by day and making sure that we're hiding your word in our heart. And that we look at our lives and say, Lord, am I following your basic instructions? Am I hiding your word in my heart? Am I meditating on it? And am I walking in your love, Jesus? Am I being kind, gentle, meek, sweet? patient, having the heart of a servant, because ultimately, Lord, that is what you're looking for in our lives, to have your fruit in us, to have a close, personal relationship with you, Jesus Christ. And as we send our roots deep in you, Jesus, and we become more and more like you, then you give us our marching orders. And then, Lord, we thank you that you help us to fight against that fear that will try to come up against us. And we say, no, I will go. And if I perish, I perish. If I fail, I fail. But I will trust in the Lord, and I will obey. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.